Would you pray with me? Now let the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. Amen. Well, welcome to the second message in the series, Enough, Discovering Joy Through Simplicity and Generosity. Last week, we talked about two disorders of the heart that can keep us from discovering joy. The first one is affluenza, which is a desire to accumulate more and more and more stuff. It's a disease of our culture. And the second is credititis, which is caused by our ability to have whatever we want, whenever we want it, without regard to whether we can pay for it or not. We can buy now and pay later. And the world is constantly tempting us to do that, to buy more than we need and more than we can afford. So if we're going to cure these disorders of the heart, we are going to be needing to ask God for help every single day before we get out in the world and get tempted. And today we're going to talk about some of the practical aspects of how we get there. How do we live faithfully and wisely? I have to admit, when this proverb first came to my attention, when I realized I was supposed to preach on it, I, it didn't speak to my heart. Precious treasure remains in the house of the wise, but the fool devours it. So what I do when I can't get hold of the scriptures, I go to another translation. I went to the message translation, and here I found it this way. Valuables are safe in a wise person's home. Fools put it all out for yard sales, <laughs> which makes me think of our rummage sale. There are things that you should hold on to, but we hope you'll bring the rest of it to us. <laughs> well, and then I, you know, that helped me kind of think about what is valuable in our culture. And really, for many of us, most of the time it's money. So this proverb is saying that a wise person can hang on to their money, but in the hands of a fool, it just runs through their fingers like sand or water and is gone. In the hands of the wise, money can be used for wonderful things, good food and good shelter, helping people in need. In the hands of a fool, it's here today and gone tomorrow. Whoosh, it is gone. And I was thinking about these saints that we honor today, and many of us. We grew up in a day when there was not an ATM on every corner. Do you remember those days? Before credit cards were as common as dollar bills, I actually went online and I looked at the history of the credit card, and it wasn't until the 1950s that the Diners Club offered the first credit card. So my parents really didn't have credit cards. They had store accounts in, with, and accounts with places where they bought things for their business. And that's very different than a credit card. And in that time, you know, before credit cards were running around everywhere, I think it was probably easier to be wise with our money. It just was. Remember how we used to do things? Some people still do. You wrote a check for everything including at the supermarket, you would write it out. And if you needed cash, what would you do? You would add 20 or $40 to the amount that you needed, and they would give you the money back. It's so, it feels so antiquated you know, these days to do it that way. You use your debit card and kind of do the same thing. Sometimes it was inconvenient. I mean, sometimes if you, couldn't, if you weren't going to the store, then you would have to write out a check to yourself, and you would go to the bank, and you would give them the check, you know, write it out to Deborah Lerner for $40, and they're rarely more than that, and they would give you the money out of your account. It, it slowed the pace of spending significantly. It was, it was not as easy to spend. But then I look at my, the next generation, I look at myself, actually, I carry a debit card. I hardly ever use my checkbook anymore. And my children don't know what they are. Do your kids know what checkbooks are? I mean, they don't know what that is. They think I'm an antique sitting there with my little check register subtracting things. Even when I use my debit card, I subtract it to make sure I still have some. They just trust the bank. 
And most of the time that works, and every now and again they do 10 or 12 transactions in a day, some of them $3, $5, and discover at the end of the day that they didn't get really posted. And when they all post, they all get rejected, and there's a $35 fee for each one of them. My kids have both done that at one time or another. And for the $20 that they spent, they wind up spending $200 with all the bank fees. You know, it's that I think this proverb really applies. Precious treasure remains in the house of the wise, but the fool devours it. Jesus told the story of a foolish young man. He went to his daddy and said, give me my money now. I don't want to wait for you to die. How rude is that? And his daddy gave him the money and he took it away and before five minutes had elapsed, it was all gone. And none of it was used for anything good. And it was just gone. I think it's a good thing he didn't have a credit card back then because he could have gotten in even deeper, right? He could have kept spending after the money was gone. In these days, debit make Debit cards make it easy for us to spend without thinking, and then credit cards make it easy for us to keep spending when the debit card doesn't work because there's no more in the account. We spend what we don't have. I thought of that old song, another day older and deeper in debt. And I think sometimes we have these moments, where did it go? And we think if we make more, if there's more coming in, we'll have more. But the truth is, the more you make, the more you spend. Have you noticed that? It doesn't, you know, all these pent up desires that you've had, you get a larger amount of money and boom, it's all gone. And much of it is used in, on impulse buying in this country. I'm an impulse buyer. Send me into JCPenney with a 25% off coupon and I'm gone. I have to stay out of there. This is the only way I can avoid it. You know, Adam Hamilton says there's some simple remedies for many kinds of impulse buying. I'm just gonna read you his, his little remedies. He says, if you wanna avoid impulse buying, don't go to the grocery store when you're hungry. Have you learned that one? I've learned that one over and over again. And shop only for what you know you need. Don't just go in and say, hmm, now let's see what looks interesting today. Go in knowing what you need. Make a list and stick to it. Buy what you need and get out of there because those places are where temptation lives and temptation will get you. And he says, if you're tempted to make a big purchase, just wait 24 hours. He says, most sales don't go away in 24 hours. If you still want it tomorrow at the same time, then, then you go and buy it. And what that does is it helps you think about things. And you know the truth is if you buy it and you didn't really need it and it's not really useful, you haven't saved any money at all. So those are simple rules. They'll help you save a lot of money, keep a lot of money in your hand instead of running through your fingers. But we also have to clarify our relationship with money and possessions. We have to remember, as we talked about last week, we're not created to spend as much as we can and get as much pleasure as we can out of that stuff that we buy. We're created for a higher purpose. The higher purpose is to love God with all our heart, mind, soul, and strength, to love our neighbor as ourselves, to care for God's creation, to care for the needy, to glorify God, to seek justice for all people, to do acts of mercy. All of those things are part of our calling. And that means that some of our money and our possessions should be directed toward those things at all times. But that's gonna take planning. You know, if you just walk around without planning, you'll just spend for whatever shows up in front of you. And you'll need to do some goal setting in the context of faith, remembering who you are, keeping in mind God's purpose in creating you. First, I thought this might not be so relevant in retirement, then I realized it really is. Because in retirement, you have these changes in situation, don't you? You're going along and suddenly someone needs a different level of care. And everything about your finances shifts. And you need to sit down as soon as you have the brains to do it and make another assessment of where you are and what it is that you're trying to do. Otherwise, you're, you just won't know what's happening with your money. 
Sometimes a spouse dies and their income goes down dramatically. Sometimes someone needs a level of care that you hadn't needed before. And those are moments for planning. So in your, pull out from your bulletin, we gave you a book today, so go into your book that was in the middle of your bulletin. There were three sheets that are folded together, and I want you to pull out the ones that have the red border, they're, they're front and back, and turn it to the page that says my life and financial goals. This invites you as you think about your finances to start about, start thinking about it by thinking about your life purpose. What is it that you're trying to do? It changes, doesn't it? What is your purpose at this phase of your life? And then you think about some goals, short term, intermediate, long term, and you write them down. Short term might be spend less. Medium term might, intermediate term might be pay down credit cards. Long term might be set up some funds for your grandkids to help them get through college. Set up some ways that you're gonna to give to charitable organizations that you love. And then once you do that, and you have sort of a sense of what it is you want to do with your money, then you go and prepare a basic budget. And there's a basic budget worksheet here. And I'm not gonna go through it here, but I don't know whether you've done this or not. Some people never ever do it. I hate doing it, because I hate seeing how unequal things are on the income and the expense side when I do what I want to do. But you start to buy, you know, what are you actually spending and what do you want to spend on the category of housing, transportation, charitable gifts, food, saving. And you write it all down and you make sure that you have enough income to cover it. It's harder to define income in retirement. So however you're defining that, if you're pulling out a certain percentage of your retirement every year, then that's your income. And your expenses need to be less than that. So you fiddle around with it until you get it to come out that way. And when things change, you have to do it again. And how then do you live into that? It's hard to live into it. I mean, you write it down, but then how do you keep track? I know some people who really have a hard time keeping track, they just turn everything into cash and put it in envelopes, you know, for the smaller amounts. And, and so then there's something for clothing and there's something for food, an envelope. And there's a certain amount in there. And if you get to the end of the dollars in there before the end of the month, then you just are out of luck. So if you go out shopping and there's a beautiful dress and it's on sale and it's 75% off and you don't have the money to buy it in that envelope, you don't buy it. And if you want to golf and the money in the golfing envelope is gone, you don't golf until next month when there's more money in the envelope. It's so hard to do, you know, it's, but it is what we need to do to keep track of what we're doing with our money. And then I want to kind of step back from that detail level and talk about six principles that are found in the Bible for living well financially. And that's on the back of the My Life and Financial Goals. It also looks like this. It's a red border with blue writing. This one is so important that if we know you and consider you already to be a part of our congregation, you got a letter or will that has this as an insert in the letter. So we wanna be sure that everybody gets a copy of this. I'm not gonna go through it in detail, I'm gonna ask you to do that and you're at home. But I wanna skip through a few key things here. The first principle that for finances that you find in this book is put God first in your living and in your giving. It's not how we usually think about it. I know people often sit down and say, well, there's rent, there's utilities, there's cars, and blah, blah, blah. And then at the end you say, well, there's $25 left over, I guess that's God's. That's not what the book asks us to do. The book asks us to say, okay, my income is this. How much am I gonna give to God first before everything else? Otherwise, we're giving God leftovers. I don't know how you feel about leftovers. I'm not crazy about people giving me leftovers as if it were something else. And I just don't think God is either. So you decide first what you're gonna to give to God and then you make everything else fit. And I enact this in my life. I get the church deposits a check and on the same day they pull out the, the giving for that period of time. So the check goes in and the money comes out first. 
and never even see it. It goes to God. That's the, the primary one. Number two is to prepare a spending plan and track your expenses. That's the budget thing. Three is simplify your lifestyle, live below your means. Four is provide for an emergency fund. Five is to pay off all credit card debt. And six is to practice long range saving and investing habits. There's scripture verses and there's further information under each one of those. So take a moment this week, that'll be your homework, is to look at these things and to think about them and to think about whether your finances are being held in a context of faith or whether you've got faith over here and finances over here. And then the other part of it is if you're gonna do any good with this is you're gonna have to sit down and pray every single morning. You're gonna have to pray before you turn on your television, before you go out into the world. You're gonna need to ask God to help you resist the temptations that the world puts before you to spend money and acquire stuff and ask God to help you become what God wants you to become. And back to the proverb, precious treasure remains in the house of the wise, but the fool devours it. And my prayer is that we should be wise and not foolish with our treasure, that we would use our treasure to honor and glorify God first and foremost, now and always. That's what we're asked to do. Amen. Oh,